And hello, welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. We're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload set up just for you. Uh, we la ended last week's episode discussing the retail apocalypse. The, a lot of retailers are going out of business. Now, there are people out there who think that this is the end of the world. And there are other people, like myself, who know that this is just another evolution in the way we shop. So we are actually going to take a look today, first of all, at our Prager University segment. Uh, we do a Prager University piece every single week, or we try to. And because we were talking about retail last week, hey, what's killing the American dream? Let's take a look. What do you call it when people have a great idea and risk everything they have, time, money, energy, to make that idea a reality? I call it the American dream. Ritu Shaw Burnham had an idea. She dreamed of opening a pizza franchise in Seattle, Washington. It wasn't easy. It never is. But she made it happen. Richard Clark had an idea. Office buildings in fast-growing northern Florida needed janitorial services. He was bound and determined to see that they got it. He grew his business to over 200 employees. Kenneth Jaroche oversees a bakery in Chicago, started in 1959 by his father and grandfather. The neighborhood has seen a lot of changes over the decades, but there's always been one thing you could count on, delicious bread and pastries from the Jaroche ovens. Ritu's, Richard's, and Kenneth's stories are played out every day across America. A million variations on the same theme, starting a business, running a business, keeping a business going. In fact, America leads the world in small business creation. With over 28 million small businesses, they generate over 64% of all new private sector jobs. And let's not miss the obvious. Every big business with thousands of employees started out as a small business. Bernie Marcus opened two hardware stores in Georgia, and Phil Knight sold running shoes out of the back of his car in Oregon. Thus were the Home Depot and Nike born. Given the importance of small businesses to the American economy, you would think the government on all levels, city, state, and federal, would do everything it could to encourage their formation and growth. In other words, you'd think the government's attitude would be, how can we help you? But sadly, this is not the case. In fact, it's the opposite. The government is killing small businesses, killing them with excessive taxes, overregulation, and complicated compliance. One such burden is the push to hike federal, state, and city minimum wage rates from about $7.25 an hour to as much as $15. Ritu Shaw Burnham found this out the hard way. So did her employees. When the city of Seattle raised their minimum wage to $15 an hour, all of the profit went out of Ritu's pizza parlor. She couldn't raise prices high enough to cover her new costs. She lost her business, and her employees lost their jobs. Instead of their wages going up to $15, they went down to zero. Then there's the Affordable Care Act, which requires businesses with at least 50 full-time employees to provide health insurance for all of them. The law's definition of full-time? Just 30 hours a week. To survive all the added costs, many small companies have reduced their workers' hours to below 30 per week. They've also become wary of expanding beyond 50 full-time employees. That's the dilemma Richard Clark faced. His workforce of 200 people, 50% of whom were full-time, is now down to 150 people with only 20% full-time. The rest are part-time. Sure, it would be great to provide everyone with health insurance, but Richard wouldn't be able to keep his business if he did. And obviously, his employees wouldn't have jobs. Kenneth Jaroche wonders if his bakery can survive the bans on partially hydrogenated oil and trans fats, key ingredients in making his baked goods. He'll have to reformulate his recipes. That will cost him a lot of time and money. And he worries about the taste and texture of his baked goods. If you're a bakery and your customers don't like your bread, well, you're toast. And so are your employees. There are over 175,000 pages of regulations like these from the federal government alone, countless more from cities and states. Small businesses have to deal with them every day. Some of these regulations are necessary, but many are not. Some sound good on the campaign trail, but create serious practical problems in real life. They sap the resources of going concerns and discourage people from starting new ones. 
They're freezing economic growth. They're like a giant iceberg, and the American dream is headed straight for it. I'm Elaine Parker of the Job Creators Network for Prager University. So there you have it. Government is stifling growth for businesses. And it obviously wasn't always that way, but that's the way it is right now. And when we see the number of Chapter 11 bankruptcies for reorganization and liquidation, that has something to do with it. Now, we're going to take a look today. We're going to go all the way back, peel the layers back. This is not, to my knowledge, going to be a multi-episode uh, series. But we're going to take a look at how we got here. How did we get here in the retail world? We're going to take a look starting right now with the Industrial Revolution, which is really where the retail industry began so long ago. Industrial Revolution, 18th to 19th century. The economic developments of the 1800s saw the development of agrarian and handicraft economies in Europe and America transform into industrial urbanized ones. The term to describe this phenomenon would be known as the Industrial Revolution and was first used by French writers but made popular by English economic historian Arnold Toynbee. The Industrial Revolution was underpinned by the Agricultural Revolution. From the mid-18th century to the mid-19th century, agricultural production increased significantly. The huge increase in food output supported the expansion and sustained a large population and boosted trade. The increased use of machines over human or animal power in farming also meant that less farm workers were needed and they could leave the land to industrial towns. Better metals and richer fuel also contributed to industrialization by creating the steam engine, an integral machine to industrialization which powered factories, locomotives and ships. The new steam engines used coal and iron both in their construction and as fuel, increasing demand for these resources. Roads, canals and railways changed Britain dramatically, connecting Britain and allowing goods to be sent over long distances. Visually, the revolution was clear in the new industrial towns, with smoking factories dominating the skyline. The cities were horrible to live in, overcrowded and dirty with dangerous conditions in the factories and strict rules and punishments. The Industrial Revolution saw mechanization in factories of the textile industry, which was previously manufactured in the home, creating the term cottage industry. Now, production could be increased on a large scale because of new inventions such as the spinning mule and the power loom. The iron industry developed with Henry Bessemer's inexpensive process for mass-producing steel. Iron and steel were key materials for constructing the tools and machinery, steam engines and ships needed for the industrial progress. Industrial labor opportunities drew people to the cities from the countryside, to such an extent that in 1750, only 15% of the population of Britain lived in towns. By 1850, over 50% of the entire population of Great Britain lived in either a town or a city, and by 1900, it was 85%. London had 4.5 million people, Glasgow, 760,000, Liverpool, 685,000, and Manchester and Birmingham, 500,000. Great Britain was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution and was the only mature industrial economy for a long time. Historians have speculated that this was because, as an island, there was relative peace and stability for Britain compared to mainland Europe. Rather than spending on a large defensive standing army, capital could be spent on other ventures and there was confidence for investors. Native resources were also abundant and readily available for initial technological developments and inventions. Engineers and inventors were also respected and encouraged in British society and were backed by wealthy patrons. A powerful navy and an empire bringing in vast wealth from its colonies also contributed to the catalyst for industrialization before others. Nevertheless, Germany, France, Switzerland, Belgium and the United States soon emulated Britain's industrial change and by 1900, Britain would no longer be at the top, with the United States as the world's leading industrial nation in the 20th century. Subscribe for more history. And there you have it. That's what led to the rise of retail. It was the Industrial Revolution which gave us the economies of scale necessary to produce a large quantity of things at a cheap price. 
That also, of course, as the video just pointed out, brought more people into the urban core of cities. But then something else happened, and that was the rise of the department store. Um, one of the first department stores may have been Bennett's in Derby in England. Uh, it was first established as a hardware shop in 1734. Um, but then the first reliably dated department store to be established was Harding, Howell and Company, which opened up in 1796 on Pall Mall in London. So we're going back to around the time of the American Revolution, we had the rise of big retail. Now, these weren't the chains, these were individual large stores. So if you happen to have lived in London, or if you happen to lived in Derby, that was the store where you went to get everything, and they had a little bit of everything. Uh, then we take a look uh, by 1824, we're looking in England here. Char Charles Henry Herod had established a business and uh, he ran the business uh, under different types and names, uh, Draper, uh, Mercer, Haberdasher, at least until uh, 1831. He was listed as Herod and Wicking uh, Linen Drapers Retail in 1825. Uh, and then eventually it was uh, Herod and Company Grocers uh, in uh, 1832. So the one retail store was changing and eventually it grew to be one of the biggest popular retail department stores in the entire world. And that of course is Herod's. Now the actual store that uh, Charles Henry Herod had established had burned down in December of 1883 uh, and yet at the same time it was uh, rebuilt and you know built up uh, around 17, uh, 1889. So let's take a quick look right now at Herod's department store. <laughs> The public expect the very best when they come to Harrods. It's the world's most luxurious department store. We have daily visitors of around 35,000 people. Good morning, Harrods. Good morning, Harrods. Harrods primes itself on its customer service, and we'd like to believe that we offer uh, virtually anything uh, in Harrods. In fact, our motto is anything is possible. Howard's is obviously very keen to stay ahead of the game. We'll use any means possible. If there's technology out there that's better than what we've got at the moment, then you can bet that we're going to invest in it. IT is becoming very important in terms of, of helping Harrods define our new customer relationship marketing strategy. With the level of customer service that Harrods provides, it's very important for us in marketing to understand who our customers are. The data that we capture from the customer transactions at the till point here in the store uh, over the internet, at harrods.com, or even at our airport outlets. Uh, it's very important for us to, to capture that data, to use that data wisely. One important thing is um, in, in a multi-channel, multi-process environment is how to manage data and the ability to see and understand the data on different channels and different processes. If you have different selling channels, and those different channel selling channels have different applications and different databases, you could end up with having um, customer information for the same customer in those different silos, which actually don't refer in your systems to the same customer. Harris has used Java Caps to take all the information from the different customer sources that we have throughout the business, extract them, and create this single customer view, a single repository of customers. I think Sun has been critical to the implementation of Java Caps, not only because of uh, obviously their technical expertise, but more than that because of their industry experience on retail and being able to, to bring the right people to design the processes from the beginning. By analyzing this data, we can target promotions more effectively, and this targeting of more personalized offers will drive sales can guarantee that the marketing programs are generating return on investment. It could be that a customer has stopped coming to a Knightsbridge shop because they've moved house. If we are intelligent enough, we can 
send them promotion to start buying through our catalogs instead of driving them to come to the store. We wanted someone that had experience on the retail space to develop a single customer view application so that we could define the business process around that single customer view application from the beginning and get the model right. We chose Sun Microsystem Solution with Java Caps because it's openness, because it's technical capabilities, it's usability and the support of a strong vendor like Sun Microsystems. Now I know that that video had ended up uh, discussing more about the current Herods, but you couldn't get here from without looking back at where they came from. Um, but now, you know, Herods, of course, controlled retail in London uh, at the later part of the 19th century. But then, what happened in the United States during the 19th century? Uh, Arnold Constable was the first American department store. Aaron Arnold uh, had uh, founded the, uh, he, and he was from Great Britain, he founded a small dry goods store on Pine Street in New York City in 1825, uh, and then ended up moving that to a um, five-story mar uh, white marble dry goods palace known as the Marble House in 1857. And then uh, he was one of the first stores to issue bills of credit to customers during the Civil War and it became a top-notch emporium and, and that was the way you know, retail was in New York City. Uh, also in, uh, in 1846 in New York City the formal Marble Palace was established by Alexander Turney Stewart on uh, Broadway and he offered a lot of the European retail merchandise uh, they were fi and uh, fixed prices on dry goods. And it looked like a uh, Renaissance piazzo, uh, buildings with cast iron construction, you know, becoming elegant now. You know, we have single standalone stores in big cities becoming elegant. And I know in 1851 in Winona, Minnesota, was I think the first retail store, that, uh, department store in Minnesota, if uh, my information is correct. Um, then, of course, we got Macy's. R.H. Uh, Macy founded Macy's as a dry goods store in 1858. And it competed with Stewart uh, with his Marble Palace as one of the earliest department stores in New York. And uh, then you had McCreary's and Abraham and Strauss. But again, these were all individual standalone places. You had to go to their store if you were going to purchase from them. That was the only option you had at that time. And eventually things moved on from there, but this all stems out of the Industrial Revolution. And when we will take a look at Macy's, uh, Roland Hussey Macy did one major thing right. He learned the power of advertising. And if you follow the Macy's chain, you have Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, it's still there. Look how many times in Hollywood the name Macy's was mentioned. Uh, Miracle on 34th Street and the uh, iconization of Santa Claus, that was, you know, with Macy's company. Uh, and retail became a big enterprise in America, be part of it because of Macy. And so we're going to take a quick look here on... Uh, the uh, well, Macy's now 160 years old, but 10 years ago they came out with a uh, short ad specifying highlights from the first 150 years. We're going to take a look at that now. This is Macy's. Everything's better at Macy's. We're known as the quality store. Hey, hey. from Macy's in New York City, the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Where did you get such a lovely outfit? Here at Macy's. Yes, I found a lot of cute things at Macy's. Good. I saw her in Macy's and she told me that she'd love to do it. The nation's biggest department store, Macy's. Oh, you can find me any day at Macy's. What is Macy's? Macy's Thanksgiving. When Grandpa McMahon used to take Little Eddie to Macy's, and Little Eddie jumped up on Santa's lap. <laughs> We're standing in Macy's, the largest department store in the world. All those huge balloons for the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. We're going off to Macy's. It's Macy's. Only one star has been a part of your life for 150 years. That's the magic 
of Macy's. And they're still around today, although they still also need to change their retail models. They've been closing stores left and right. But now, how do we go from having a standalone department store to where we're at today? What's that next leap? So, Industrial Revolution gave us mass uh, merchandise, mass production on uh, merchandise, a lot of goods sold, uh, produced cheaply sold in department stores. What's the next evolution? Well, that is actually thanks to um, George Gilman. Um, Gilman and Company was founded in the 1850s um, in Manhattan. Um, there was uh, 1863, there was a, the, the Gilman Company became known as the Great American Tea Company. And it quickly opened five stores and grew from there. Now, in 1866, the Great American Tea Company was valued at more than $1 million. But then, something happened in 1869. Now, mind you, I guess I'm gonna pause for just a second and go back and take a look at the change, not just in industry and production, but take a look at where the people were living and how they moved. We didn't really have the, ra the railroads never existed until I think it was 1826 when the first railroad in America was established in Quincy, Massachusetts and was a very short line. I think it was about a mile long and it was just simply to move uh, marble from the quarries in Quincy, Massachusetts to the docks to be able to be transported in order to make the um, Bunker Hill Memorial. That was the first railroad. It was a very, very short railroad. I don't even think it uh, required head-end power. Um, but things from that railroad grew. But, by, but at that time, in the, you know, prior to the 1830s and 1840s, when we, you know, railroads were just getting built up, everything was done by the steamboat. And even before that was barge. So, or wagon, horse-drawn wagon. So mobility and getting the goods to the people was extremely difficult. So that's why you had to go to the store. You had to go into town in order to pick things up. You, if you recall ever watching Little House on the Prairie with the Ingalls family, every now and then you'd have an episode on the TV show or written in the books about have, how they all had to make a trip to town. And they'd get in the wagon, they would go down to the general, uh, the, the uh, dry goods store. That's how retail was done because of the lack of mobility. And it was increased mobility in transportation that allowed for an expansion of population throughout this country. So with Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, uh, the new name for the firm in 1869, that was because of the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad. And so Gilman, he created the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company, and it was to promote the concept of prepackaged tea. So out of the New York offices, they would you know, put the tea in the packages and ship it down the rail lines and then, of course, have stores along the way. It was a tea company. And they used the Great American name for its mail order purposes. So we're starting to see now that catalogs and, and a little bit of mail order is start, you know, starting to happen here. And really, you can look at the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company as the start of chain retail. And of course, we now know that as the A and P stores, that lasted only you know all the way up until uh, 2015. So three years ago, they went bankrupt. I actually looked at their bankruptcy uh, uh, record last night, and they're still arguing over some uh, parts of it. So that bankruptcy is still actually open, is an open case, and still on the books. So the company technically still exists, but that the operation has wound down for a while. Um, but it was really, um, you know, uh, in the 1870s, well, it's like, for instance, uh, after the Great Chicago Fire of 1871, um, 
George Huntington Hartford, who would join the Gilman and Company as a store clerk, uh, he, uh, he eventually was able to run the company, and he brought A&P to Chicago after the fire. And, you know, again, it was just rapid expansion. At, if you were to adjust for inflation, after the height of, at the height of the A&P dominance in the retail market, if that same valuation were to cross over to today, they would have a valuation of $38.9 trillion. That's how big and powerful AMP was in the 1920s, 1930s. So AMP had really expanded on bringing the number of stores to communities for a single operation throughout the country. So you have department stores, now you have the beginning of chain stores, which uh, really occurred uh, in 1878 with uh, George Huntington Hartford. He's the one who really built it up, but Gilman brought the, be the beginning of the chain concept. And so we're going to take a look right now at a look back at the A&P stores. Of all the supermarkets in America, there's one that's seen more daybreaks, opened more doors, and shared more hellos than any other. It's filled more baskets and blown out more birthday candles, grown up with more babies, and stayed up with more parents. It's graduated, celebrated, and cried sometimes too. Of all the supermarkets in America, there's one that's seen more new beginnings and happy endings. It's watched more young men go out into the world and waited with their moms for them to come home. It's carved more birds, poured more eggnog, and counted more blessings. And through it all, from every cart full of new things to every cup full of comfort, there's one thing we've looked forward to more than any other, and that's every tomorrow there is to come. A and P, the best is yet to be. And that was the iconic grocery store. One other thing about AMP, uh, going back to the 1912 presidential election, um, food prices were really a big deal in that particular election. There was a 35% increase in food prices in 10 years. And you want to talk about inflation. I hear people complaining about, you know, portion sizes being cut from the last uh, great re recession we were in, but a 35% increase in prices over 10 years, that's, that's up there. And yet, the Hartford, or, you know, A&P stores, they decided that what they would do is try to concentrate on volume sales, and so they cut their profit margin down to 12%. Now, keep in mind, a lot of the department stores, they operated at the 40 to 60 percent margin. So if you take a look at their costs, if their cost, say for, for an item that's $10, their cost might be $4 and they're charging you 10. So they're making $6 on what they get for $4. Well, under AMP, especially with, the fo with food, uh, they ended up, saying, hey, you know, let's buy it at, at wholesale. Uh, cream of wheat actually uh, was their big breakfast, um, the bre big breakfast uh, item that they had sold. And they had purchased it at 11 cents per box and ended up having a big to-do here because they were actually undercutting the market. Uh, so their, their product price that they were buying at wholesale is 11 cents a box, 3%, le 3 cents less than any other com competitors were able to buy it for, and then only charged a one cent markup. And of course, Cream of Wheat now sued A&P, and the U.S. District Court ruled against A&P, but uh, AMP then started to really manufacture some private label brands and were able to control the market that way. And by this time in 1915, they had 1,600 stores nationwide. So that's what AMP brought. They brought the volume of buying a, a large quantity and volume and shipping to a great number of stores. So whereas we had the Industrial Revolution, that brought us retail to begin with. Now we have, uh, then we go to department stores, then we get chain stores, 
And do you see where we're going here? You know, that's the, what's the next phase in the business cycle? And that's actually what we're looking at. I mean, really, the next phase started more with Montgomery Ward. Um, when Aaron Montgomery Ward established a dry goods uh, store in Chicago in 1872. Notice that this is kind of the next thing. And at, in, um, after a few years, Aaron Ward started that, you know, bulking up that mail order business. Now this kind of occurred at the same time as Richard Warren Sears, who was born in Minnesota, Stewartville, in uh, December 7th, 1863, he was born. And with Sears, he ended up, um, he, he ended up uh, becoming a, sta a station agent in uh, Redwood, Fall what we call, now call Redwood Falls. It was then known as um, uh, North Redwood, Minnesota. And there was a, a, a well-known fraud going on. And I actually wasn't well-known then, but there, there was a, a fraud. We talk about phishing schemes now with e-commerce. Let me tell you what the phishing scheme in 1883 was. Jewelers would make watches, and then they would find the name and address of a jeweler in another area, and they would take these watches and send a box of them to the jeweler. Now, of course, how do they send? By this time, the railroads were the main form of transportation. So these boxes of unsolicited product of watches would show up addressed to a jeweler, well, of course, the scam would be, well, I've got the merchandise, I might as well sell it, and then they'd end up sending out the, uh, paying on the invoice. And there was a jeweler in North Redwood who had received a shipment of these watches, and the guy said, I'm not buying them. And he gave him the Sears and said, you can go ahead and send them back. Well, Sears said, you know what? I'll sell them because he had realized that there was a need for watches in rural communities and along the railroad because the railroads, of course, operated on time. And if people didn't know what that time was, they would miss the train, whether it be passenger train, whether it be trying to get their uh, merchant, their wares, you know, if you're a farmer or, uh, or a rancher and you're trying to get your product to market, you need to make sure that you can get your stuff on the train. And so he saw the ability to get watches into the hands of people who couldn't, you know, who really couldn't afford them or have an interest in them otherwise. So he went, he started the R.W. Sears Watch Company. And then, and that was, uh, yeah, he started in, in 18, uh, I think it was 1882, 1883. And then by 1886, we have the R.W. Sears Watch Company, 1887. Then Sears ended up with his first mail order catalog. In this case, he had offered mainly watches and some diamonds and jewelry, but mainly watches. And then he ended up selling that business in 1889 for about $100,000, $2.7 million today. And he had moved to Iowa, intended to become a rural banker, but then he moved to Chicago. And then he established a new mail order firm with watches and jewelry. And he hired Elvin Roebuck to fix watches. That's all he did. But eventually they created Sears Roebuck and Company. And they became the largest mail order. So just like you had the rise of the chain stores under AMP, now we have the rise of mail order between Sears and Montgomery Wards. So let's take a look right now, a little moment on Sears history. Their mail order business offered an alternative to high priced general stores and created one of America's most famous partnerships. Who were they? These business legends are brought to you by Delinco International. 
In 1886, 22-year-old Richard Sears launched his jewelry mail order business. Alva Roebuck was a watchmaker who answered a one ad in the Chicago Daily News. Mr. Sears hired Roebuck, added product lines, and started what was to become Sears, Roebuck & Company. Around 1900, farmers in rural America bought their supplies at the general store. Sears Roebuck offered a mail order catalog at reduced prices thanks to volume buying, low overhead, and free delivery. In 1906, a mail order plant was opened in Chicago with over 3 million square feet of floor space, which at the time was the largest commercial building in the world. By 1908, sales were an amazing $40 million a year. By 1925, Sears opened its first retail store, and by the late 20s, stores were opened on the average of one every other business day. Richard Sears and Alva Roebuck, business legends. So that's a little bit on the history of Sears. Um, so what do we see now? Again, we're gonna, I'm just going to repeat. Industrial Revolution brought us the department store. AMP brought us the chain store. Now we add mail order to the mix. Then Sears and Montgomery Wards are really the big mail order people. What was happening with the general store? The general store was going out of business, and I hear people complaining about uh, the mom and pop stores of today, and it's because the retail market was changing. Sears put a lot of mom and pops out of business too, just like Montgomery Wards did. They did. They put the general store out because businesses have to compete on price. Consumers are price conscious, mainly, or most of the time. Now, if you have money and you're going to go and buy a luxury Jaguar car, you're not necessarily price conscious. But that's that 1% that the Democrats keep telling us about. But for the other 99%, if I were to follow their narrative, people are pretty much con price conscious. But even those who live in the upper 1% are price conscious because they've made one, you know, th 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 such a high amount of money, they want to preserve that wealth. So without diverging this into a different direction the fact is retail changes department stores chain stores mail order catalog then we hit the great depression then we hit world war ii some places went out of business because it was tough economic times this goes back to our very first discussion about what's killing the american dream 1930s, the American dream was dead for a lot of businesses. But then what happened after World War II? We had just suffered through 15 years, essentially, of economic depression and war. And now there was a newfound sense of optimism. And we had an opportunity to get into suburbia. And somebody saw something, and actually it was designed here in Minnesota, and that was the shopping mall. Let's take a look at the origins of the shopping mall as it appears in Southdale in Edina. The Shopping Mall, an American icon rarely acknowledged for its landmark status. It's easy to forget that less than 60 years ago, shopping was a drastically different experience. It's a happy-go-spending world reflected in the windows of the suburban shopping centers where they go to buy. With the suburban boom of the 1950s, consumers were looking to avoid trips downtown to individual stores where parking was becoming difficult. So Austrian-born architect Victor Gruen designed a building to solve those problems. He set his first design here in Edina, Minnesota, a suburb of Minneapolis, and called it Southdale. Today, Southdale may look like many other malls in America, but it is the first indoor mall ever built, and that makes it significant. So this is this court is part of the original court, and there were uh, two department stores. Tom Fisher is a professor of architecture and dean of the College of Design at the University of Minnesota. He spent plenty of time studying Gruen's original plans for Southdale. So Gruen's idea of putting competing mall department stores on the either end of the mall would be that it would attract more people and also as people went back and forth between the two department stores it would uh, generate more traffic to the smaller stores in between. The concept of the enclosed mall with competing department stores, ample parking, climate control, 
and multiple levels of shopping was a revolutionary idea when Southdale opened in 1956. I mean, what were people used to at that time? How was, why was this such you know, just a brilliant idea on his part? Well, Victor Gruen felt that the shopping centers at the time, which he called extroverted, were typically a parking lot and stores facing the parking lot with big garish signs. And he thought that they were ugly and they weren't a very good shopping experience. So he envisioned the mall as what he called the introvert type. And so basically he took the stores that used to face out to the parking lot and faced them into an enclosed mall. And part of his idea was to control the signage and the aesthetics so that it was all a modern, minimalist aesthetic. Um, and the, also his hope was to get people out of their cars and interacting in a pedestrian environment more akin to what he experienced in Vienna. So he wanted to actually create a bit of urbanity in the suburbs in the mall. Gruen hoped to bring some European charm to his vision of the shopping mall. He incorporated original art, like this Harry Bertoya sculpture. The mall originally had an aviary and hosted fashion shows when it first opened. The idea of an open-air cafe might not seem unusual in Europe, but inside a U.S. mall, it was certainly different. And again, many of these things we now so take for granted because Southdale was really an archetype. It was really the model that then was replicated hundreds and hundreds of times everywhere, so much so that we just assume that, well, this is just what a mall is. But of course, it took somebody like Victor Gruen to imagine it and to do it the first time. The opening of Southdale was covered by the likes of the New York Times and Life magazine. But as original mall manager Marty Rudd recalls, not everyone was a fan of Gruen's design. The Frank Lloyd Wright, of course, had to come. And you can imagine how excited he was about this and how complimentary he was. No compliments at all. With 1,511 indoor shopping malls in operation today, the impact of Gruen's design is clear. In fact, there was talk of designating Southdale as a historical landmark, but because the mall has been updated over time, very little of the original building remains. The mall isn't the physical structure. The mall is as a, it's a social and economic idea. And so the fact that it changes over time, uh, I think is fine. And I actually think Bruin would be fine with that too. I'm Tracy Wolf, reporting for the News Hour. So do you see where we're going? Department stores, chain stores, mail order catalogs. Now we get to the shopping malls in the post-war boom. So now what's next? The discount chains. Kmart, Walmart, Target. That was the next progression and we're going to take a look right now at how Sam Walmart really revolutionized the discount chain concept. It was in the late 40s and early 50s that the people of Arkansas, like most Americans in those post-war years, were full of hope. And as the economy shifted from a military emphasis to one that was consumer-driven, the feeling was anything was possible. It was in this northwest Arkansas community of Bentonville that Sam and Helen Walton purchased Luther Harrison's Variety Store and demonstrated their confidence in the future and in the people of this area. It was 1950, and they opened the first Walton 5 and 10, a Ben Franklin franchise with the Walton name. Sam had purchased the Bentonville Store after operating this Ben Franklin franchise in Newport, Arkansas. He and Helen had been there for five years, and they were quite successful. So successful, in fact, that the man who leased it to them wanted it back. During the same time, Bud Walton had opened his own Ben Franklin in Versailles, Missouri. By 1959, Bud, Sam, and their families owned nine franchise stores. In 1962, after becoming Ben Franklin's largest franchisee, Sam opened his first large discount store under the Walmart name in Rogers, Arkansas. It was less than one-fifth the size of today's average Walmart and had only 25 employees. Its volume and promising future led Sam to make a trip to the Ben Franklin offices in Chicago. 
He went there with an idea. Don Soderquist, then a data processing officer for Ben Franklin, recalls Sam's visit. His purpose was to share with him, them this idea that he had of taking a discount store and putting it in a small rural community. He said, I've already opened a store in Rogers, Arkansas that I would consider a discount store. And I'm convinced that there's a lot more business in those smaller communities than what most people believe. So I would like you to consider selling me merchandise for a discount store at a lower price so that we can together uh, try this new venture of serving the rural communities with discount stores. Well, after a morning of discussion, they told him they just really didn't see a future. And, and besides that, they couldn't offer him merchandise at a lower price than what they were selling to the Ben Franklin franchisees. Undeterred, Sam continued to pursue his vision. And two years later, in 1964, he opened his second Walmart in Harrison, Arkansas. It was anything but a smooth opening. Here's how David Glass, then president of a drug retailing chain, remembers the store upon his first visit. Uh, when I saw the Harrison, Arkansas store, uh, I, I thought to myself, this is, this is absolutely the worst discount store or retail store that I've ever seen. Uh, Sam bought a couple of truckloads of watermelons and he'd stack them up across the front of the store. Uh, he had donkey rides for the kids out on the parking lot and what he didn't anticipate is that the temperature was about 110 degrees in Harrison that day and the watermelons began to pop and that watermelon juice began to run all over the parking lot and uh, the donkeys did what donkeys do. And, uh, and sort of tracked through all that. You can imagine what it looked like. The thing I didn't realize about Sam, though, and the people who were involved in those early days in Walmart is that they had a quality that I haven't seen in many people or in many companies. And that was that there was never a day went by that they didn't improve something. And improve Walmart did. Within another five years, Sam and his associates had proved the doubters wrong. A discounter who truly offered the consumer the assurance of low prices every day could be profitable in rural America. The 70s can be called the decade of growth. In 1972, Walmart was listed on the New York Stock Exchange. This initial 100 share certificate would, after eight two-for-one splits, represent at the end of 1989, 25,600 shares worth well over one million dollars. The 70s saw Walmart grow in many ways. From its first 60,000 square foot distribution center in Bentonville to four centers with combined space of one and a half million square feet. In 1994, and what did you notice about that? Sears started with mail order to rural communities. Walmart ended up putting chain stores into rural communities. What's the next logical thing as technology increases? Amazon, which brought even more merchandise selection into rural communities through the U.S. Postal Service. And that's where we're at right now, folks. This is just the next progression in a long running chain of change in the retail industry. So let's take a look here at how Jeff Bezos built Amazon. In 1994, a young Wall Street hotshot named Jeff Bezos was at a crossroads in his career. Continue amassing a small fortune or abandon it all to sell books. That decision would single-handedly change the history of e-commerce, publishing, film, TV, journalism, and quite possibly interstellar travel. That decision also represents a recurring theme in his life, never settle, ever. This is how Jeff Bezos took a simple idea into a garage and built one of the largest marketplaces on the planet. Jeff Bezos was born on January 12, 1964. As a child, he turned his parents' garage into a laboratory for his inventions. In his 1982 valedictorian speech, he discussed colonizing outer space and turning Earth into a giant nature preserve. Graduating from Princeton with a computer science degree, instead of going straight into tech, he had other ideas. 
You don't become a billionaire unless you have this insatiable desire to accrue wealth and power. But I think he just looks at it in, in a way that's really different to almost anyone else I, I follow. That's Tom Metcalf. I'm a billionaire reporter for Bloomberg News. You know, he's always driven by success, and, and Wall Street was the pinnacle for most graduates. He was a very mathematical graduate that really fitted his almost quant-like outlook. He quickly made a name for himself. At 26, the youngest ever vice president of Bankers Trust Company. At 28, the youngest ever senior vice president of D.E. Shaw & Co. It was there that he discovered a giant untapped resource, the internet. You've seen the internet grow by 2,300% a year. In all his time at a Wall Street firm, he's never seen such a growth opportunity. He went through a whole list of industries, and if you think about books, easy to package, hard to damage, and of course the internet offers an infinite library. D.E. Shaw did not share his optimism. For the opportunity of a lifetime, Bezos would have to leave Wall Street. Whatever it is that you want to do, there's going to be risk in your life, and risk is a necessary component of progress. And he quite simply packed his stuff up, drove across the country, and you know the legend goes that while in the car, he was writing the business plans. Setting up shop in his garage in 1994, he incorporated his book company under the name Cadabra. It wasn't great when a lawyer misheard it as Cadabra. We ultimately landed on Amazon uh, for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the, the name began with A. It was likely to be on top of any alphabet or web search. He kind of liked the fact it kind of tied in with the world's largest river, and he was certainly had plans to make Amazon the world's uh, largest company. Launching in July 1995, a bell was installed to ring every time a book was sold. In its first month, Amazon sold to people in all 50 states and 45 different countries. The bell was gone in weeks. All their expectations were smashed. They thought it may be sell dozens of books the first week, in fact, hundreds and thousands. And, and of course today millions. By September 1995, Amazon processed $20,000 in monthly sales. With its 1997 IPO, Amazon was valued at $400 million. By 1999, Jeff Bezos was worth $10 billion and was Time's Man of the Year. But soon after, the dot-com crash had people skeptical. Was Amazon a sustainable business or would the bubble burst? I think anyone who's met Bezos knows me is extraordinarily charismatic and, and very convincing. In terms of a long-term vision, he, he had it mapped out for decades. Whatever happened in the short term, he wasn't going to change that plan. And I think he, he conveyed that pretty well to his stockholders. With the crash eliminating many competitors, Amazon strengthened its grip on the market and expanded beyond books. The Kindle, Alexa, Amazon Studios, and of course... Amazon Prime. What it does is really lock people into the Amazon ecosystem. They're much more inclined to be buying a lot more. Word of mouth spreads. And that has been the biggest driver of Amazon's incredible revenue growth. Yet, historically, Amazon has seen modest annual profits. An enormous amount of cash flowing through the company. And what Bezos does is he's not returning that to shareholders. He's reinvesting that in the company, for sure in its core businesses, but also going off for these almost moonshot projects. My vision for Blue Origin is millions of people living and working in space. This is such a game changer. Amazon to buy Whole Foods. Jeff Bezos is now the richest person in the world. $250 million for the storied Washington Post. His acquisition of the Washington Post not only raised eyebrows, but put him at odds with another well-known billionaire. He bought the Washington Post to have political influence if I become president, oh, do they have problems. They're going to have such problems. Bezos and Trump are probably as different as two entrepreneurs can get. Trump is pretty reactionary, you know, kind of emotional, whereas Bezos normally doesn't really respond. So once he did suggest he'd be willing to send Donald Trump into space. And, you know, I have a rocket company, so the capability is there. Few businessmen choose to make an enemy of a president. But having built an empire out of a garage, Jeff Bezos has proven capable of handling any adversary especially complacency. Where are we now? Amazon now is replicating what Richard Warren Sears did a, over a century ago. Essentially, we're doing the electronic version of a mail order catalog. Your traditional retail operations, many of them which are now going through bankruptcy courts, have to adjust to that. That is the new retail environment, just like general stores needed to adapt to Sears taking over with mail order, and most a lot of them went out of business. Chain stores revitalized department stores. Department stores ended up taking the chain store concept and building up into you know, uh, larger things, and they were the drivers behind the shopping mall concept. Discount stores came in, 
and took the chain concept into you know, uh, discount stores all over the place. But now when you're adding e-commerce in, which last week we discovered is 20% of all uh, retail is the e-commerce market, what happens? The other stores all have to you know, take shape. But there's one thing in common with all of these companies that I had uh, highlighted today. The thing that's in common is that these people were believers in retail, believers in customers, and they wanted to help out the customers. Profit came second. Whereas a lot of the companies that are going out of business have been taken over by private equity firms about 10, 15 years ago, and these guys are only in it for looking at the asset valuation and not necessarily profitability. They don't necessarily bring in the right people to run a retail operation. Most of them don't care about retail operations. They sure don't care about the customers. Because if they did, they wouldn't be in the positions they're in. A lot of the private equity, not everyone, but a lot of them come in with the idea of trying to turn it around and spin it off in three years. We're going to put the money in, we're going to get out. Put the money in, get out. That's the way that a lot of the private equity firms operate. The private equity firms 10 to 15 years ago bet big billions on big retail. As we discussed last week, just before the housing crash and the global financial crisis and the Obama economy. So now here we are. Big private equity firms are trying to go out, get out of the market while you have large competition within the e-commerce world. And now we're at a pivot point in retail. And the, what's the next big thing? Amazon has done what Sears did, but obviously we're seeing Sears heading into bankruptcy. Maybe not in Jeff Bezos' lifetime is Amazon going to fall, but at some point in time in the future, there's going to be a change. But it's going to be what's that next big thing, that next concept. And whoever figures that out is going to be a billionaire. Uh, but in the meantime, it's the way it goes. we just got to play this one out. But we're going to leave you with our music segment today. So we're going to take a look at a shopping mall in Romania with a military brass band. And we did get word today that Charles Lazarus has passed away at age 94. He is the founder of Toys R Us. Now, considering that there's 277 shopping days left of Christmas, uh, it doesn't look like Toys R Us will be there. So go and get your deals now. But that's all for this week. For Dallas Pearson Producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're watching North Star Oasis. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.